In the studio, we've been joined by the Freetown City Mayor, our worship mayor, Ingo Makisoya. Our mayor is here to talk about flooding mitigation, revenue collection by council, and her take on the provisional results of the 2021 midterm population and housing census, among other things. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Phoebe. Good morning, Marina. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, viewers. Uh, it's the rainy season. Let's start with the flood mitigation. Mm -hmm. And we know when it rains, there's flooding, especially in, in, in Freetown. Uh, what's the council's plan this year for flood mitigation? Thanks, Phoebe. Um, I guess one of the things that I'm really, really proud of um, in terms of introducing vocabulary into the Freetown language is flood mitigation. We first did it in 2018 and we've done it every year since. Um, but of course, you know, I suppose there are two things that I want to highlight. One, why do we do it? You've already alluded to the, the fact. And the, the term flood mitigation speaks for itself. You know, we're trying to reduce the risk of flooding. So that's the, that's the why. Um, how do we do it? We have consistently over the last four years, this is the fifth year um, from 2018 to now, assessed key flash flood points by working with communities because the communities know precisely where the blockages are. Um, and so we've traditionally or historically moved through the communities with counselors, with um, community disaster management teams to identify those. And then before the rain start, that's been the way we've done it. Before the rain start, we've unblocked those. And a lot of the blockage, um, there are some places where it's garbage, but the majority of what's unblocked is silt. So I want to take a little bit of time to explain to viewers why we have this silt. Um, and then I'll explain where we are this year. Okay, uh, let's go with the, uh, the silt. The let's silt. The, so the silt. Creole red dotty. It's actually the topsoil and it's coming from the mountains down, the hills down to the plains. And why is it happening? Deforestation. Because when you have trees, the roots of the trees actually hold the soil back. So when rain comes, the rain is slowed down um, and it seeps, gradually seeps into the soil. And if you remember your geography, I'm not sure if you did geography, but I did. If you remember your geography, that's the rain that replenishes your aquifers, your water tables beneath the ground. And then you'll see that rain coming, that, that water coming out as a stream somewhere else. You know, you'll see water coming from rocks. That's, all, that's the water that you tap into for wells. You know, when you want to build a well, dig a well, or borehole. So it's so important for that rain not to rush off, run off as it's called, but to go down into the soil. But what we're seeing is indiscriminate deforestation. And for me, it's driven by two things. One of which is related to the census, because we see so many people moving into the city. Rural urban migration is a fact. You know, and as you saw in my letter, although we're not talking about that yet, as you saw in my letter, with the images, you see the growth of communities year by year. And as they come, they cut trees. But it's not just communities. Now, the concern with that is uh, there are times when you would pass by along the streets and you would see uh, whether it's council or some institution or just, you know, the youths in the area. They try to get it out of the gutters. And leave it there. But then, yes, but then even with that, once it rains again, it it's comes almost back. as if nothing, nothing was done. done. So it's a problem in itself. How is the council fixing this, even if it's temporary? So this problem is one, when you talk about who has responsibility, you must talk about who has the mandate. So indiscriminate deforestation is something that is really bad and I took time to talk about the water because I wanted you to realize that it's not just the flooding when you've got too much water but it also leads to water scarcity because that same water has run off. It's such an important point. How do you prevent this sort of deforestation and I also was about to say it's not just 
people coming from the rural areas. This is also, we have seen land being sold. Um, these areas that we describe, these hills, these are part of our protected areas. This is uh, the western area protected forest. That's where most of these, you know, the, most of this deforestation is taking part um, or taking place in. Um, so it's really upsetting to see that this land is being sold um, and people have documents from the Ministry of Lands. So, that, so, so the starting point with the problem is for there to be real commitment to the protection of the forest areas. And there is an organization called the uh, Nat National Protected Areas Authority, NPAA, who have that mandate. That mandate is also with the Ministry of Lands. You have the Forest Guards. You have the Ministry of Environment. They all have that mandate. And yet we see deforestation happening at an alarming rate. I know from Guma ba Valley Water Company, because as I've mentioned, water, the flip side of the flood is the water shortage. And Guma has seen the lowest level of the reservoir last year because of the deforestation. And they said to me that in the last two years, we've seen more deforestation in the water catchment area let me, than let me, in the last 20 years. Let me quickly ask that a question, is significant. Madam Mayor, talking about committee. So council, sorry, just to say, unfortunately, the role that council could have played and is really willing to play is one that we are yet unable to play. Okay. In other countries, how do you protect? How do you ensure it's through building permits? Because if you actually have a building permit regime that works, nobody builds without a permit. And to get the permit, you need to be meeting environmental um, um, criteria. And in our case, what we've done is develop a building permit code which would prevent people from being allowed to build within the protected forest with, with on hillsides which are steep. Yesterday, there was a disaster. You may not even have heard. Mountain caught. A house on the hill collapsed. One person died. May his soul rest in peace. One person died. Many were injured, five hospitalized. This is happening every day because land use planning, building permits are not being, there's no, they're not functional. These are functions which according to the Local Government Act of 2004 should sit with the city council. But consistently, even though the New Direction Manifesto gave it as a promise that within one year they would devolve, here we are more than four years in, a city council really willing and ready to work with government to protect the forest, to ensure we have a building permit uh, um, process that ensures the environment is protected, not just forests, but waterways. We see people building houses in the rivers, in the streams, blocking water, leading to flooding. So this is the cause, and this is why it needs to be addressed at the root cause deforestation must be stopped. So this brings in my question when you talk about commitments. There are fundamental problems in terms of addressing the menace um, of flash floods. I mean, rubbish has been emptied uh, in the gutters by very Residents. people, you know, and what can be done to get um, them understand that they are the compounding problem? That's really a really good point, Marina. Um, and I'll, I'd say that, again, none of these things are a simple answer, it's always, we need to look at all the pieces. Um, but before I actually say that, uh, Phoebe said something that we didn't quite get to, and she talked about the fact that people take garbage out, silt out. You, you mentioned it's a recurring problem. Mm -hmm. I've explained why it's recurring, that the only way we can deal with it, which is why we're planting the trees, but even the trees we plant are at risk because we've planted in areas in hill station where that land was then sold, and then the person just brushed all of the trees that we planted. So it's got to be a, a comprehensive solution, but at the heart of it, we've got to protect our forest. Now, to the other point that you raised about the silt, because it is really distressing. We started our flood mitigation on Saturday, but we're all aware that SLRA has been digging the gutters already. 
And they're doing so with the funding from the Road Maintenance Fund, which actually is meant for, for city council. But it's gone to SLRA, we've met with them, we've met with Road Maintenance Fund, and we've said to them, okay, we don't really understand why the national agency has the money that should come to the city, but be it as it may, please do not leave the silt on the ground, on the side of the road. Because what happens? When the rain comes, it washes back. Some washes back into the gutter, but I've seen on Kutan Road and other places, on Kisi Road, where it washes onto the road. And it's just a complete mess. So we actually really are appealing to SLRA. We understand that they're, not, they're working with contractors, and we've asked them to please ensure that when they take the silt from the gutters, please remove it immediately. Don't leave it overnight. That's the way we've done it historically. We remove it immediately. So on Saturday, I got some real muscle work in because I was with the teams. We had our excavator, we had our front end loader, we had our skips. We've done this for four years, this is the fifth. We know what works. We work with the communities and we ensure that as the silt is coming out of the gutter, it is moving away to Bome. So um, to the point now about the garbage. Mm -hmm. In everything we do, in urban management, in city management, in fact, in governance, we need to know that what you need to build are systems and processes. And the system that we've introduced for householders is one where we tell them, like anywhere else in the world, even in our sub-region, we don't expect people to go and put their garbage on the street you know, anywhere, randomly on the street. Garbage needs to be paid for. The vehicles that I just described, that collected the, the silt, they need fuel. And now fuel is at 18,000. The people who lift the garbage need to be paid. So garbage collection costs money and it needs to be paid for. We've got a, a system where, unlike other parts of the world, our property rates are still very low. 82% of our property rate owners pay between, or rate payers, pay between 100,000 and 500,000 a year. With 100,000 leones, you can't even fill the tank of one of our trucks. So we know that we as the council are subsidizing that. But what we want residents to do, what we've advocated for, is to ensure that they have a waste collector themselves. So we have the number 8244. Marina, if you don't have somebody who collects your garbage, <laughs> you can call 8244 or you can go to Find Me in Freetown. And there you will see, it will pick you up with GPS um, and tell you you're in this location. And then when you click on Find Waste Collectors in My Area, it will give you the list of all waste collectors mm -hmm. in that area. So that tricycle guy, or Masada, or Mr. Clean, all of their numbers will be there. And it's your responsibility to call and ask for someone to come. You contract with them from 2,000, 3,000 for a bag to 5,000, depending on the size of the bag. You contract with them, and they collect your garbage. They're registered with the council, so you must not put your waste in the gutter. Mm -hmm. This sounds simple but oh yeah we all see what happens and i think one of the challenges that we've experienced is that people got into the habit of saying well government they can't take a national cleaning day we remember the piles the mountains of waste and there's still people who refuse to remember and understand that that is not a system that's sustainable salon man i can talk say and I'm going to say this in Korea because I address the people there. The same woman, we're able to buy a Rivon, we're able to make a nail. you able to pay 2000 let them go throw you dirty. Fine girl, not let you dirty, let Christmas take them, not give small pick in a net, let go Ibam Nagota. That's our biggest challenge. But it's a challenge we've been overcoming. We've seen that, so two pronged, well, three pronged. One, sensitization. As we did the gutter clearing that day, on Saturday, and it, it continues with the team, and I'll tell you how many days we're working for, et cetera. As we did that, we also went house to house in the area to speak to residents and say, 
who collects your garbage? Most people would give us the cop out. Hey, when we see them, tricycle, we can call them. But we don't want it to be when we see. We want you to register. So we know and you know that on Thursday, your tricycle guy is coming, his name is so-and-so, and this is his phone number. So that community engagement will continue. In January, we engaged the chiefs, all the tribal heads and the sub-chiefs, and we gave them, we delegated authority to them. We signed an MOU so they can actually set up task forces in their communities, and they can find themselves directly up to 100,000. And how has that been? in terms of um, sensitizing people? So I think it's the, the chief started well, but we definitely want to encourage them to do more. Um, because, you know, if you think about a hillside community in the middle of the night, who's going to be around to see the person put their garbage in the gutter or in the stream? Only the community. So it's got to be done like a neighborhood watch. So we, we are continuing to engage. We're going to do a refresher with the chiefs to remind them that the power is now in their hands and to ensure that they're working. They have the phone numbers of the Met Police. They have the phone numbers of the sanitation officers. But I will say again, uh, um, Marina, that when it comes to flood mitigation, this rainy season, what we see far more than the garbage is the silt. Now, before we go to the revenue collection, John, uh, uh, most of the solution to the flood is long term. Yes. Uh, with all the processes, getting the system right, it's long term. But getting the, the mandate, term, immediate in mandate. The short term, how do we manage this? Because not too long ago, uh, it's over the weekend, there was again an awful site at Kisirut. Yes. When it rained, yes. how do we manage this in the short term? Yes. So one thing which would be great is collaboration. You know, we didn't know that SLRA had been given the funding for council. Um, that was what funding the council is supposed to have. We didn't know. We just saw them on the streets. And what, what uh, raised the alarm was exactly what you've described. I drove along Kisi Road on Saturday. It was a distressing sight to see all the garbage on the side of the road, in fact, taking up a lane, not a workman in sight. They've dug, they've moved on, and they've left that garbage there. So one thing would be good collaboration. That is really important. We have decided as a council that we're not going to allow that site to be there. The average person will not know it's SLRA. When they see that, they think city council. So we're gonna take the bull by the horns. We've continued to advocate for SLRA and Road Maintenance Fund to keep us informed. They've given us the list. We know they've been paid. We understand. I'll take that back. <laughs> we understand they've been paid in excess of a billion leones to do this work. In excess of a billion leones. So we don't understand with that amount of money, when we work with so much less, how it is that they're not able to cart the rubbish away, the silt away immediately. But with our limited resources, we're going to make sure now that we're doing a sort of, and we started it on Saturday, in addition to where we are working, where we see that garbage there, we'll do our best to clear it for the sake of the residents of Freetown. And can I also just say, Phoebe, on that point, you know, the funds gone to SLRA, but you might be surprised to learn that as of today, the 20th of June, the GOSL, the government allocation, for everything for the local councils, from the hospitals, because we do, you know, we work with the secondary hospitals and the PHUs, the government sends the funds for their, um, up, not really upkeep, really it's more for fuel for generators, food for the patients. None of that money has been paid. No council has received any allocation yet this year not a penny. So we were really surprised that given you've not, we've not received even the small token that's in the budget for us for sanitation, that the funds which should come to council from the road maintenance fund instead went to the Serlion Road Authority. But that's done. What matters now is that they do a good job. We won't sit back and ignore our responsibility 
even though we are stretched for financing, which is why we're doing this revenue mobilization. So, so, so let's have your take on the revenue mobilization. Um, where does the council stand in regards to generating, you know, um, funds for its operations? Okay, so uh, um, we, we have to, it's, it's part of our mandate, we have to generate funds. 60 to 70% of that revenue comes from property rate. As I've said, we've had zero from government, which means there's a gap. Our administrative budget actually was already cut down. In 2018, our administrative budget from government was over two billion in the budget. This year's budget for 2022, administrative budget, or 2021, administrative budget, what was dispersed was under 200 million. So you can see we've already got a smaller and smaller budget. Um, and the idea is that the council raises its own revenue although it would still be nice to get what's been budgeted for, but we're supposed to raise our own revenue. And we're really, we're really, really uh, um, glad that, that we have the mandate. And what's important is that we're given the space to implement. Um, so our revenue mobilization drive that we're starting this morning for Etonians, we were out there. We actually started the sensitization last weekend, weekend before last. We had our parrot, which is our our vehicle with the um, megaphone on top of it, go around and remind residents that in accordance with the Local Government Act, each house owner, property owner, is supposed to pay property rates to council. As I've, I've said earlier, we need to re be mindful of the fact that 42% of all the property owners in Freetown, and we have over 107,000 now registered on our property database, over 42% of them, your property rate for the entire year is 100,000 euros. That's all. Then for the next band, the next 40%, taking it to 82% of the whole population or the property rate payers, it's between 100,000 and 500,000. So 82% of property owners in our city pay no more than 500,000 leones a year for their property rate. And you can pay by installment. You can pay from January right through to September. You must be finished by September. But you've got a whole nine months to make that payment in accordance with the law. Beyond September, you then get a fine. If you're over the age of 70, you get a 10% discount. If you have a disability, you get a 10% discount. Council does not want you to pay to anyone in their hand. We have a banking system. You can pay at the nearest Echo Bank, Roquel Commercial Bank, um, Zenith Bank, and Standard Chartered Bank. But we also know that for those who are only paying 100,000 leones with fuel cost as they are, and this is what's led to this change of strategy, <laughs> to visit the there could be other opportunities to pay, to pay. Mobile money, for so the mobile money you can use for local tax but the system we have um phoebe at the moment we've not been able to it's it's something to do with the api gateway we've not been able to connect it to the mobile money but what we've done is we've given you a mobile bank so as of today in partnership with our approved bank particularly zenith is working with us on this we are now taking the bank to the people because we know that with transport costs as high as they are if i live in calabar town it might cost me thirty thousand to come to city council to pay there or even to come to one of the banks in the cbd so we are moving with the banks so over the next 30 days you're going to see us in across the city we have three teams one in the east one in the center one in the west the teams comprise the councillors, the bailiffs, the, the valuation department, the business license department, um, and the Met Police. And we are moving, as I said, with the bank tellers because our principle remains, council does not collect the money. The banks receive the money. So when we go to you with the bank teller, they will give you a deposit slip and then they'll come back to the bank and upload the system so that your receipt is generated. If you want your receipt, you receive it, you can receive it, you can come and get it in your own free time, or if not, 
it will show on the system that you've paid. So when your next property rate demand is issued, it will recognize that you paid. So council wants our residents to ensure that they contribute to the development of our city, to the running of our city, but we also know that it's hard to move with the high cost of transport, so we are moving to you. And the other thing we're doing, and I'd like to uh, um, you know, make sure everybody understands that, somebody would say to me, as they always do, wait in council to do for we. <laughs> so we will be taking with us a mobile LED screen, the advertising trucks, um, and they, so we'll be playing for residents the videos that show the construction of Wilberforce, of Wilberforce Market, a three-story market, the construction of the cemetery wall um, at Secular Road, the flood mitigation work that's going on, the sanitation, the sweeping of the streets. We want residents, the bridges that are being built, small bridges, culverts, built in communities. We want our residents to see for themselves the smiling faces of the children at Congo Water Nursery Market and the market that's about to, the nursery market that's about to open um, at Kutan Road. Let residents see where their money is going. But we, we, we can't not pay and expect work to happen, particularly as there has been no revenue, no allocation at all. And it's not just for the council. All 22 councils Let's are in the same position. Let's look at the where um, the council is losing money, where it should be making. Um, I recall we had this operation free flow at mm -hmm. some point where fines were levied. If you throw garbage, if you urinate on the streets, you yes. get to be a fine. Yeah. That in itself was uh, a generator of revenue. Exactly. Yes. And it's not happening anymore. Yes. And with the sensitization efforts, yes, it contributes. But you still have the recalcitrant people yes. who would still do the wrong things. And that's a, a, a revenue generation. Yes. So you're so right, Phoebe. I mean, th this is why I say it's a multi pronged approach. We've spoken about the um, flood mitigation. We've spoken about the registration of households, but you've touched on another area, which is enforcement. Um, and for that to happen, uh, we had, again, um, in 2019, we had made huge progress. We had brought on board 50 military police to augment our police force. We were in collaboration with this, the Traders Council. Um, the 50, Met police, uh, 50 military police we were paying. The Traders Council, we were paying. That was able, that enabled us to swell the numbers of our enforcement personnel. When in 2020, the government stopped us from collecting property rate for a year and a half, even though there was a small allocation given to us for the last three months of the year, it set back a lot of those processes. But the other thing that is so interesting, Phoebe, is the number of people engaged in street trading now compared to three years, two years ago, three years ago, has increased because more and more people are in the city as things have become more and more difficult in the rural Should areas. Should we expect a, a, situ a, a point where it would get to and there would be fines levied? We, ha we levy fines. What you don't see is, what you don't see, and again, this is about resources, what you don't see is the, the media around what's being done. But as part of this exercise, because we want people to know, we're collecting, we're clearing the gutters. We want you to register for, house, for household waste collection. And I mentioned to you just now that when we were moving on Saturday, we moved to the Met Police. So you're going to see, we had something called Sanitation Patrol, which brought it to the eyes of everyone. We cannot take all our limited Met Police and have them do an operation as a one-off. The operation free for these are one-offs. What we want is systems. So we've now divided our Met Police. They also operate in divisions. They have, so we've got an East Division, there are two divisions in the East, East 1, East 2, Central and West. We are working on giving them more mobility, you know, because there's only so much you can do in a space and time. So oh, what can people physically, find for? You can find, the, you're, you breach our bylaws, you urinate on the street, you 
illegally deposit waste. That's 500,000. When we went out, when I joined them on Saturday, I went into a compound. They had a pile of garbage, pile. And it was clear what they would do if they would wait for the rain, and then they would go and throw it into the gutter. We got, I got the Met Police to come in. We wrote them a letter right there and then on the spot, inviting them to council. They'll be, um, they'll be queried, I think, I'm not quite sure. I don't think query is the term. Um, they have a term that the health inspectors use. Um, they'll have to come and answer. We also called a tricycle to come and register them straight away, and they will be fined. 500,000. Uh, that's the area okay. where the council loses money. You, you have uh, this new building with a huge parking lot, and there's a need for parking accommodation across town. Uh, it's such an inconvenience for the residents to suffer the consequence of something they did not set up, a system they did not set up. All the buildings, all the buildings in the city, minus this new uh, building, don't have provision for parking, either for the workers, chocolates of the customers that come, and it's the customers who suffer. You want to go to the bank, someone comes to clamp your vehicle. Yes. I didn't build the city in a way no. that it doesn't make provision for me to park, Absolutely. but the citizens suffer. Yes. And then there is a whole huge space wasting at the It's not building. wasting, it's not wasting. Number one, there are 100 spaces, just 100. We use, we have spaces for council. I have a space, as you'd expect. So Wait, sorry, just a minute. We'll come back so you respond to that. It's 8.45. Before we left on that break, you were talking about the, uh, the building. building and the yes. parking. Yes, uh, so, so, uh, so our building is very, very um, um, fully, it's fully utilized. Our building is fully utilized. Um, we have, of course, council, and we have a small number of spaces, I think probably five, which are sort of this, myself, senior management of council. Then we have um, the audit service ceremony, who have spaces, they take two floors. We have The View, which is a hotel, a restaurant, and the bar at the top, the roof garden, they have spaces. And then of course, we've got to keep some spaces for when we have people hiring the auditorium and, and um, the conference facilities uh, on the third floor. Um, but actually, one of the banks, who I won't name yet, because I don't, I'm not sure we've signed um, the agreement, but one of the banks, because we wrote to all the banks in the city, um, in the CBD area and said there are X number of spaces left um, in order to make it easy for us not to manage day, daily parking for that small number of spaces, I think it's about 34 spaces, is any bank interested in taking up the remaining spaces and paying the council up front for that? And a bank has agreed to do that. So, you're generating revenue. so we are generating re revenue from, for all the parking but spaces. But beyond that as well, I'm still stuck on that inconvenience. For the custom, for the residents. I am a Fritonian as well. And yes. there's that inconvenience. You go to town and you struggle for so, a parking spot. So and I think, because of course yourself, you, you, you've been one of those Sierra Leoneans from the diaspora. Mm. Out of Sierra Leone, in, in other countries, in the UK, the US, you pay. The, the councils. And the councils are responsible. Are under the council. The councils are responsible. A huge revenue mobilization stream for you because now when we park, we get to pay the boys out at the streets. Five, ten thousand. That's money that the council could be collecting. So why is it not happening? So back in 2018, as part of Transform Freetown 2019, under our um, sector, again, like I always say, Transform Freetown is what we live by. It's what we do. Um, and so we have under resili resilience, uh, urban mobility. Under urban mobility, we have street parking. And we developed a plan and a big shout out to engineer Mudupe Williams, uh, Marima, and actually Georgette Green also worked on this. We developed a comprehensive plan with our street depart parking department, um, Victor Lahai and others, to ensure that we brought in zoning, controlled parking zones, similar to what you would see, not only in, in, the, in the West, but even in Monrovia. You know, even in the sub-region, other councils are responsible for street parking. We hit a challenge with SLRSA, who then said, no, it's their responsibility. 
Um, we had a series of meetings with the Ministry of Local Government, with the Office of the Vice President, and so forth. Um, and it really just stalled. But we haven't given up. And very importantly and significantly, um, residents might know, Fritonians might know, that just a couple of days ago, less than a week ago, um, Friday, Monday, Monday of, of last week, a, a week ago today, a week ago today, I was in Zurich, in the city of Zurich, where that city council has done something which is a first. Um, through a conversation with their mayor, who is also a lady, um, um, Frau Corinne Mausch, the mayor of Zurich, we talked about how a very prosperous city like Zurich, in collaboration with Freetown, could do something to support the Transform Freetown agenda. And we landed on the CBD regeneration, Central Business District regeneration. And so they took it to their council as a resolution to their council. And Switzerland is a very consensus, they have a very consensus driven governance system. They actually went to their residents and did a referendum to ask their residents to vote on them introducing a mechanism which we would be the first to benefit from, but which allows them to use council resources, their own residence resources, to support a council overseas. It was successful. The process began, the planning began um, some months ago. We had two of their Swiss consultants here. They met with a host of stakeholders, a range of stakeholders, SLRSA, SLRA, Ministry of Transport. I believe they also met with the Minister of Western Regions team, um, of course, with um, our, our staff and, and so on. Um, but the design, why am I bringing this up? Because the regeneration of the Central Business District has a number of components. Um, one is a controlled parking zone because you cannot regenerate the Central Business District with people parking anywhere and residents not being able to access the services that they want to access in the city. It also involves, which is why we had all of those stake stakeholders on board, it also involves widening the pavements so the pedestrians have more of a free flow themselves, improving on the street furniture. Ministry of Energy we also met with because solar street lighting and green spaces. So, so this is what the CBD regeneration looks like. And I'm really, when I said earlier on, we need collaboration. We need collaboration for this to happen. I'm confident that even though we had this challenge, um, which has meant that three years on, we've not been able to bring the improvements in street parking that we'd like to, now that we have uh, effectively trained Jadonka inside with their support, that we will work in a, in a collaborative way and demonstrate to you know, our international supporters that we really want to see progress in our city. The funding is 2.5 um, million Swiss francs, which is about $2.5 million over five years. So it will, it will be done incrementally. Um, and the control parking zone will kick off, we hope, before the end of this year. So Phoebe, the idea, the plan has been there. Implementation has been challenging. But I'm confident that we all want a better Freetown. And if we have the opportunity to have resources come in to enable us to work collaborat collaboratively to do that, then no one is going to stand in the way of making life better for Freetonians. So let me, let me bring you back to um, the property rates. There was a fight between the council and the central government in implementing the new system um, dealing with property rates. How has that uh, pan out for the council? So um, let me remind everyone that that was in 2020. It, the letter came out on the 16th of June, 2020. Um, we were then told that there had to be, um, there had to be, what do they say, guidelines written by the ministry, something that never happened since 2004, but hey ho. Um, those guidelines were done in September. Um, and then we were told, okay, you can move forward. Then it was like, no, stop. No, it has to go to parliament. Um, it didn't go to Parliament by the end of the year, but then in February 2021, we received a letter from the Ministry of Local Government saying, and Ministry of Finance saying, you can proceed. So we have been proceeding with the property rate system since 2021. 
So um, for residents who are hoping to hide behind that, sign Odi for Haido. Everyone's got to put your property. As I was coming just now, NRA was giving announcements on the radio saying GST d deadline is May 31st. If we know that it takes money for a government to function at the national level, then we should know that it's the same at the city level. Here is my dear friend and sister talking about what she expects to see as a resident in Freetown in respect of street parking to design a system to, to put the machines, or in our case, mobile money, because we know say something like TFT, metal go, you know, to do all of that requires funds. So let Freetonians to clear the gutters, to make sure Bome is in good condition, to ensure that we actually have the ability to replant trees, to green spaces. All of this requires money. So property rates, 82% are below 500,000 for the year. There is a 14% who pay over 2 million. That's right, you know. But those properties, it's, it's, it's linked to the value of the property rate is linked to value. So it's a progressive tax. It means those whose properties are valued less, pay less. Those whose properties are valued higher, pay more. Um, but we all have a responsibility as Freetonians to contribute. If the residents of Zurich have passed a referendum and have agreed to use their taxpayers' money to improve our city, then we who live here should be willing to pay our 100,000, our 1 million, depending on your house, to, to contribute towards the development, the growth, and the daily cleanliness of our city. Talking about Bome, correct me if I'm wrong, um, a week or two ago, I was around that end. Um, in the site is unbearable. Yesterday it was. To, today, no, uh, um, Saturday it was. Go there today. We've been working there over the, okay. the week. But again, Marina, let's be real. You know, your, your mom, I've seen the, little, the pictures of the little person. Mm -hmm. um, so you run a household, as does Phoebe. We all do. But think about it. In your household, what's been the impact of the petrol increase on your household? What is it that you used to do that now cost you double? That's the same for the council. We're not able to say today, property rate owners pay us more. We, but at least pay us what you're supposed to pay. It's not easy. We all know things are hard. But at the same time, we can't function without money. And if we don't function, this place that we live in will not only grind to a halt, but it will be a complete and total mess. And from a health perspective, you're going to see people sick. So the little money you have, you'll be going to hospital because there'll be vermin everywhere. Malaria will be more. Flooding will be more. So it's, a, it's one of those things where you, we need to do our bit, contribute to the Osusu, hard at is, as it is, so that we can help us all to live in a better city. Can I say something? I know that when you talk like this, when one talks like this, if, if you have, um, if you think about it from a different angle, you think about, well, where does the growth come from? Because we can't just stay where we are, which is why for me, wealth creation is really important. It can't just be, if, if the fuel price has gone up, then we've got to find a way, not me as the mayor, but us as the residents of our city, of being able to generate more. So in our small corner as a city, we constantly are thinking um, through how we can support that. Okay, we'll definitely come back to you, ma'am. Now, Mayor, let's come to talk about your uh, concerns with the census. Uh, you've made some publications on social media, uh, but what do you have an issue with? <laughs> Thank you so much, Phoebe. Um, what do I have an issue with? Hmm. Okay. Um, 
I suppose I would look at it as I explained in my letter to the uh, um, statistician general, and I am still waiting for a response to that letter. It was an open letter, um, but it's still, it is still a letter addressed to him, and I'm hopeful um, that he will respond. What do I have an issue with? I'm the mayor of the capital city of Sierra Leone, a city called Freetown, with a population of at least 1.2 million people. Um, that has defined the work that we need to do. It also determines how we're able to resource that work. I, I grew up in Freetown um, as a girl in the 80s. See, Marina and Phoebe, na, na, try no matter, try your body before, na, far away. Um, a girl in the 80s, when our population was about 500,000, I know what Freetown felt like when it was 500,000. I know what it felt like to walk along Shaka Stevens Street and there was hardly anybody there. I know what it felt like when you pretty much knew your entire neighborhood by name, you know? Um, I know how small the class sizes were in schools. I know how a place like Lomley felt like you were in the countryside, you know? Um, and how we had the water fountain there. Hill Station was the countryside. When my parents were building their house, I was already grown. I had already gone to university and I was living abroad. Um, that was in the, the late 90s. Um, and going up to Hill, Hill Station um, by Lali Drive, which uh, is, is now known as 30 Junction, it was a forest. We had monkeys. Um, they even used to see leopards. That was when Freetown had 500,000 people. Fast forward after the war, and we began to see the streams of people. As people came um, um, when it was unsafe, even during the war. Of course, some people went back, but many never did. And then we have seen in more recent times, so that was the growth of the slums. And, and a couple of years ago, um, um, I went to South Africa with a young lady who came to live in Culvert community during the war years. She, she recited a poem about slum, live, slum dwelling, and I just was blown away. And we talked about that journey, and it was representative of the journey of hundreds of thousands, indeed, you know, uh, uh, yeah, hundreds of thousands of people over a period of time. And we've seen those slum communities. When I was growing up, and again, even as an adult, um, because my love for this country is deep. Huh? You know, my, the first time I began to do uh, um, volunteer work um, was in the early 90s. Um, and a group of us, Leone, we called ourselves Leone Development Fund, um, worked in Krube, putting toilets in Krube. This is back in 92, 93. And I was work, living and working in the UK. This was charity work that we did. And of, uh, um, so back then, the slums, you could name them. You could name them all, everybody knew them. It was Crew Bay, it was Susan's Bay. You know, now we have 74 informal settlements. And as you saw in my letter, the thing about growth is that you can see it with your eyes. We have aerial images that showed, not back when I was a girl, but from 2015, the date of the last census. We took the images for 2015. 2020 to 2022 and we, we you, you this is all you know we've got technology now you can actually measure the num the, the the growth um in size of these and you see so the you exponential the growth uh, captured for the western area oh totally Berlin, totally based on the growth you, you the, so i'm explaining to you that physical sense of growth and the aerial images of the informal settlements and the reflection of what that means. Somewhere like Wilberforce, which was a quiet residential area, now packed with people. We, like I said, 74 informal settlements, many of which I came to know for the first time when I ran for mayor and I went behind the hills of Bambayila. You know, you go up the hills so in Kanengo. So higher figures for the western area of it? Let me just first, um, yes, d definitely, but let me first explain to you why this data is a problem. You said, 
Why is it a problem for me? What's the concern I have? The concern I have is that to deliver services, you need to have the right data. The World Bank, when I came in, one of the, the reports that I relied on heavily when I was planning Transform Freetown, when we were planning Transform Freetown, is a report written by the World Bank and published in the presence with the Ministry of Finance in, I think it was published in October 2018, called Freetown, the Urban Sector Review. Freetown as an engine of growth, Urban Sector Review, a detailed study of Freetown. So from the face of it, you have first the physical growth, which we can all see. Second, let's take some of the verifiable data that's out there, starting with NEC's own data on registered voters in the city. NEC registered voters in Freetown was 609,000. Who are registered voters? Only those over the age of 18. And I heard one of the uh, um, speakers in, in an AYV on Sunday event the other day saying, oh, it's neck, let's not take it seriously. I was like, double take? Um, excuse me? Neck, it's on the basis of neck that I'm sitting here as the mayor. It's on the basis of the neck that the parliamentarians are in parliament. It's on the basis of neck that the president is in state house. How can we not, how can we ignore neck, neck data that we shouldn't we shouldn't be here. So we know that the neck data is people. I know that me, humbly, I can say with joy and gladness that 309,000 people voted for me according to the letter I received from neck. And I didn't have all the votes. I had 59.2% of the votes of, for mayor. The next person was 27% below me, but they captured the rest of the votes between them. There were seven other contestants but I got 59.2. Those are real people who went to a ballot and dropped a ballot. But I went to a, 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 a dropped a, a vote. The explanation we got um, from statistics is that uh, when it comes to uh, 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 um, the Western area urban, there is Western urban to rural migration going on right now, people uh, leaving the urban to settle in the rural. So you, you consider places like number two, Eva, how people go, you know, to these places to yes. construct dwellings, they leave there and then come to the urban every day for yes. work or school yes. and go back. Yes. So that in itself, is that explanation not enough justification for the figures? So my, my challenge, the challenge I have with that explanation is that we've got Two sets, well, I think in my letter, I, I pointed to three data sources. You're telling me now that those who registered to vote in Freetown in 2018, now 400,000 of them have moved to rural. Um, and rural's population has gone up by that. So we should have a gap. We should feel, we should feel the numbers reduce in our city. But I've just told you that we actually see our city informal settlements growing. Those are people. Those are people. Now let's look at the actual data. When it comes to the property rate, we did that after the election. And those are properties. And we, we, those pe people are living in those properties. Um, we have on our books now, we talk about revenue realization. We'll be going out and asking you to pay your property rates. But thankfully, we have your data. We have the geo mapping. We see every property. We can pinpoint on our system every property. We know we have 107,000 plus domestic properties. We know from the 2015 census that there are about, on average, 9.2 persons in a domestic property. So roughly, that's about 900,000. Then you take the informal settlements, the Slum Dwellers Association, with funding from World Bank, mind you, this wasn't just a back of the envelope exercise, did a population profiling of just 58 of those 74 informal settlements. And they counted 344,000 people. So you put the formal structures and the informal structures together, you're well over 1.2 million people. So I've got my housing data, our housing data. 
because that data is reliable, or else NRA would not have paid counsel for that data in order for them to use it for their rent tax. So it's credible data. So they've, we've got that data. Madam Mayor, let me ask this question. Um, do you think the figures are flawed and um, will hamper the planning and development? Completely, the completely. So you know earlier on, I talked about the CBD regeneration and I t mentioned to you that I met with the mayor of of um, Zurich okay. at, a, at, a, at a program where I'm on the board of the Mayor's Migration Council. We're also both on C40 Cities. C40 Cities is the organization which on the 7th of July will be back here again because C40 Cities will be in town. They're in town this week actually for um, informal settlement upgrade uh, planning lab, but they'll be in town for the cable car program. Um, They'll be in town with GIZ for the cable car program and we'll do all the publicity then. But our membership of C40 cities is based on the size of our city. Our funding from even the government of Sierra Leone, which we have not received yet, is based on the size of our city. Our ability to attract foreign direct investment, private sector investment, philanthropy investment, is based on the size of our city. You know the expression, Ide Inodu? We're already experiencing that here in Freetown. The capital of our city, how can, uh, our capital of our country, how can our capital city be reduced by 42% and us expect it, expect that to be, to be acceptable? For me, the data on the schools is also relevant. And I've heard, I heard Andrew Lavallee saying, oh, the children come from Godrich. No, we run the school buses. Um, and we know the numbers of kids who can afford to come from the rural to school in Freetown is not high. Of course, you have the more well-to-do families who will ferry their children into you know, the, the well-known schools, the Annie Walsh, the Prince of Wales, and so on. But that's not the average. That's not the majority. So if, if the data from the Ministry of Basic and Secondary School Education, we can even take out those high, you know, those sort of famous schools with the, just a few of them. Yeah, let's take that data out. If you take the rest of it, you've told us that you have 400 and is it 13 or 14,000 children registered in schools in Freetown in 2020. Let me just take those children are generally between the age of six and about 18. So that's your school going population. Now let's add to that the ones 18 and over. And I'm gonna go with the neck again. So that's 400 per 600, 1 million. We haven't counted the kids who aren't in school yet. And we have a very high birth rate. So we have all of those little ones running around. We haven't counted the many people who do not register to vote. So even if you say, Phoebe, people have upped and gone, how many have gone? How many people are moving and building houses in rural? People are building houses. Many of them are coming from out of Freetown. We still, so I'm not going to talk about out of Freetown. I'm going to talk about Freetown. Our lived experience in our informal settlements, in our schools, with the population registered to vote, just... and the aerial images to confirm that. Madame there is Mayor, no way that our population has reduced by 42%. No, but let me quickly say, because the initial response was people didn't sleep in Freetown on the night. They traveled out of Freetown on the night. That's, that's where my question so comes So we've in. done a calculation. For you to, our buses are generally 50-seaters. That's like one of the, the biggest buses. For you to move even 100,000 people to go and register somewhere else, that would take 2,000 buses. 
Do you think nobody would have noticed so, 2,000 so buses? So if you, for for the 400,000, for the 400,000, you'd have need, needed 8,000 buses. This How many in, buses do we have in Sierra Leone that are 50, 51 seaters? This bring in, brings in my question, Madam Mayor. Your city is the fourth populated in the country. I mean, where do, you, where do you stand on that? Our city is the fourth populated in the country. I think that's absolutely ridiculous with all seriousness. Um, I, I'm really, I, I'm gobsmacked. I'm gobsmacked. And I will make a distinction, Marina, because I know that you called it my city, but I need you to understand that these are districts. So your comparison is a comparison of other districts. Can you tell me who the first three are? Um, I you, you, do, you, do you have them there? No, I don't. I, okay, I don't. well, whoever they are, the, the ones that are bigger, it's districts. So Freetown, Western Area Urban, is a district. It is a city, but it's also a district. So you are telling me that there are districts which are more densely populated than the district city, because we're the only district city. We're both a city. What makes you a city? What Urbanization. Makes that, what makes that impossible? I think our lived experience, urbanization is, is when you say, you say urbanization, if you go to any of the data, any of the report, you, you will see that urbanization, when they talk about urbanization, they talk about density of population. So you, you're going to see the people. We know, I mean, I've been to Kenema uh, um, recently in September last year. We drove for miles through Bush, miles. Kenema city itself is small. It's very small, and, and, uh, and in terms of population density, you only need to go, like I said, go to Eastern Police, go to Lomli, go to Bottom Mango, go to Texaco, and you will see the people. This is not rocket science. It is absolutely, I mean, the, the aerial data, the neck data, the school data, the property data, the informal settlement data, all of that is in contradiction to the results of the midterm census. And our lived experience. Yesterday, I was explaining to you, there was sadly a, 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 a mudslide, a banking, they call it banking, when you backfill the hill and then you build. This is the reality. Hundreds of thousands of people living on the hillsides and along the coastline of Freetown. From Dokoti to Thompson Bay to Crabtown to Rokupa, Pamuronko, these are people living Mainkine, Moiba, tree planting. There are hundreds of thousands of people living in these communities and they're not hidden. So I don't know how we can possibly say that our city's population at a time when rural urban and migration is real. there are people who also refused to be counted. And there are those who say they waited for someone to show up. Nobody showed up. I've seen people, and I'm sure they won't mind because they put it on their Facebook pages. I've seen people like Nasu Fofana, like Honorable Davis Cole, um, even people who don't normally go on social media, like Tanya Fraser, all saying, we called the number. We asked people to count us, and no one came. But for me, I'm not, this conversation is first and foremost about the development of my city, development of our city. It's first and foremost about us taking an action, on, or statistics Sierra Leone, trying to take an action that would mean that we are no longer part of C40 cities. We would no longer be a city by many criteria in the, in the organizations that we have engaged with, that have provided support, enabled us to be able to move forward with the cable car system, enabled us to be able to do a CBD regeneration, enabled us to get funding 
to do the transfer stations enabled us to get funding to have over 1,000 young people working now as waste collectors and earning a living and being able to run their own business and further their education. We'll that would We would no longer be a city. We are now a small town. We're going to read some of the comments on our Facebook page to allow our viewers also uh, 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 you know, have a fight. Uh, Yoki Musa says, Madam, could you tell us what type of development you brought into our council? Can you tell us the issue between you and your deputy mayor? Because last year some conflict came out. Can you identify that to us? Bernard um, Awono Williams says, the problem I have with FCC is that they do not send in our demand notice for property tax and business license early. Council should try to be doing that, if possible, second week in January every year so as to enable property owners to pay their taxes early. Uh, Ronald George Stone says, the chief administrator and the mayor should work hand in glove for a better Freetown. But this doesn't seem to be the case. And it's giving Freetown the boosting uh, uh, it needs for many opportunities like boosting tourism, which will boost the economy. If only party politics can be put aside for a better Sierra Leone, but doesn't seem likely. Kabiru Jamal says, Ibn Akisoya, the best mayor ever in the history of Salon. And uh, Mano Philip says, Ibn is just the very best. Um, a lot of complimentary messages there. Uh, Samuel Williams says, exactly, you can walk in Wilkinson Road over five minutes, not a single car or pedestrian, very quiet. Um, then, um, Osfriend Kamara says, can I know if the central government portioned to the Freetown local government, FCC, the sum of $50 million grant from the World Bank IDA? This grant is aimed for the resilient urban Sierra Leone project. Donald Bock, uh, he says, the Berlin City Garbage Company is ready to negotiate with any company in Freetown who are ready to buy these vehicles. Please give my telephone number to Madame Mayo. Please, 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 I am ready to help because I want my country to look better than the situation we find our country in now. Uh, he also added his email address. Uh, probably I'll just take a screenshot of this message to share with the mayor. Cherry Barry says, Freetown is the face of Salon. It should be clean and beautiful. And if you can't afford to pay your taxes, please move out and make way for people who are ready to do that. Bramo K says, you may be right, Madam Mayor, but if again, 50% decides not to take part because of their political association, then let the government start with the 500,000 that were willing to be part of it. Ibrahim Say Kamara says, wow, oh, this is great, Mayor. Fritonians, please comply with this opportunity created to reduce the impl implicit cost of going to the bank and other buttons. Mayor is to create even visualizing the growth and development of Sierra Leone with this law for her people. Keep flying the flag and integrity of transparency and accountability to Fritonians and beyond. Mano Philip Sisse, he says, I slept in Freetown on census night. Um, Fasia Toka says, SLRA are not doing the cleaning of gutters properly. Was at Kisi Road last week, they will clear this particular area and leave the other parts. You think they should allow you to lead and teach them, but they will base it on politics. God bless and continue to provide for you more financial blessings from every part of the world. Don't depend on government, you are God sent. Lawrence Bangula says, apologies. You have to demolish and rebuild your future Sierra Leone. Please forgive some of us. Some of us tried. Mm, like I made mention, Phoebe, and so many complimentary messages. Smart, intelligent, and hardworking person. Keep up the good work, uh, worship. Uh, Elder Locks Pius says, for the APC hierarchy to come out and say their supporters should not be counted was a fundamental mistake. I think they only realized this after the census. If you're uh, if your wish was for people not to be counted, then why complain of the outcome? If I may ask, please ask the mayor if she was counted as against the wish of her party. Well, those are the messages we would take for now. Response to the messages. Thank you very much. So I've made a note of them. Um, somebody started off with the deputy mayor.
so I can reliably inform you that the de deputy mayor is currently on vacation in the U.S., um, having a really good time, um, and there is absolutely no problem between myself and the deputy mayor. Um, the January RDNs, so as we all know, this is a new system, um, and there is a, actually a technical process that we go through of closing the, um, the current year and then reopening it for the next year and then printing the RDNs. This year, the RDNs, the demand rate notices, um, were distributed in March, which is not January, but it's still, I would, in my opinion, not that late. Um, but we do take your point on board. Um, please be patient with us. In the 2023 cycle, we would have overcome a lot of the teething problems we had in the 2022 cycle, and we do hope to have the demand notes out in January. But that said, if you have your demand notes in, in March, um, we are respectfully asking you to please make your payment. And if for some reason you don't have your demand note, please do come to the city council um, um, or send an email to info, I mean, maybe it's easier to come. Come to the city council and let us know or contact your councillor, let us know the address and we'll send someone to ensure that that demand note is distributed. Then somebody else talked about the chief administrator again. Um, I think you are behind the times. Um, the chief administrator and I are working very well together. We have absolutely no problem. So please rest assured and don't be worried. Um, the person who said Wilkinson Road, you can go for minutes on Wilkinson Road and see no traffic, no cars and no pedestrians. Oh, I think the person was alluding to the explanation you were given earlier. Oh, in the old days. Yes, yes, absolutely. In the old, back in the day, as they say. Yes, certainly not the case now. Um, and then uh, the person who said um, the Russell P project, I can't tell you the exact amount, but I can tell you that um, we've got uh, some of our tree planting money came from the Russell P project, as well as the, for the first um, 550,000 trees that actually came from the Russell P project, the World Bank project. And that World Bank project is also going to fund this particular one you mentioned, the Resilience Urban Sierra Leone project, is also going to fund the new sanitary landfill at Hastings that will enable us to close Bome. And we were part of the design of that right from the get-go. And when I say we, I mean Fidel City Council. For the gentleman in Berlin, um, we uh, thank you so much for the offer of, of vehicles. We're not in a position to buy vehicles. Um, you know, vehicles cost money. And this comes back to the point we were making before. Um, and, and so... He yeah. actually said any company in well, then that's not necessarily be the council. Well, then, then, then you know, I'm happy to, 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 to amplify that message for and on behalf of him. Um, but it, maybe just for clarification purposes, um, we're not in a position to do that at this point in time. Um, and then the person who talked about, oh, 50 percent of people didn't. So I, I think I think it's really important for us to get something clear here. Um, the purpose of a census is to enable government to plan for development for its people and to allocate the resources appropriately so that they go to where the people are. That's the purpose. Um, the process of getting that data, if it is flawed for a myriad of reasons, um, I know that today COP is going to be having a press conference um, at which they'll be speaking to this issue in more detail. But let me just say this. I saw the data and I saw the, I, I, well, I was aware of the process of COP collecting survey data from people in this city. Through that exercise, they engaged people right across Freetown. And over 84% of the people who were engaged back in January said no one had come to count them. I know a young man who is an enumerator. He was part of the census process. He lives in one of the slum communities. He was sent to Bo. He told me a lot about the process. He told me how they had no transport, so they were making up numbers. He told me how when he submitted his numbers, 
he was told that the numbers were not enough, that they should add. He explained to me how in Bo, in the villages that he went to, he saw properties that were deserted, and yet he was told to give names for those properties. He also said that in his slum community in Freetown, where he lives, a slum community of thousands of people, that not a single enumerator went to that community. So yes, there was a message from COP, including APC, that said, we don't believe in this process. Don't be counted. But if we were so influential, if it was so influential, um, then you would expect that everything that's said by COP or APC would be adhered to by all the population. It's not. What we saw is more reflected in the Facebook posts, the social media posts of ordinary Freetonians, in the dialogues on radio and television where people said, no, they're not coming to me. Me, I'm not being vexed, so. I'm not saying they're not coming to me, oh, but no, we're not come. But be that as it may, that's about the process. What we need to focus on now, if what our interest is, is truly development, are the results. So a census is only a census if people are counted. You can't say we counted half of you, but that's still a census. And that's what I'm going to work to. And you would not count or share. How can you effectively allocate resources, plan if the numbers are flawed? The cause of the numbers being flawed is up for debate. There are those that say the reason the World Bank pulled out, the UN pulled out at the last minute, was because they saw that the pilot had not been evaluated. They saw that the numerators had not been effectively trained. They didn't have confidence in the technicalities of the process. They felt it would be flawed. The reasons for the process not going well did not start with COP. It actually started with concerns from technical partners. Now that said, today we have a result that tells us, contrary to everything that we can see with our own eyes, that our city, our capital city, is 42% less in size, contrary to what we experience every day, and it, that makes it, and that so makes it, as we, that makes it up, untenable. What are your expectations going forward? My expectations is that government will recognize that you, a census is not about half the people. A census is about all the people. A census is not about, well, I've been telling you not do, I'm so osh. No. If it's a census, you must count. If you did not count for whatever reason, then you must put that to one side and recognize that the capital city of Freetown is not now smaller today than it was in 2004. Thank you very much, so Madam Mayor, for joining us today. How interesting. Thank you very How much interesting. for being part of the program this morning, Madam Mayor. We'll take a quick break and after that we'll come back to continue with the uh, final segment.